<laughs> I guess we can start already. Uh, so welcome to our session. Um, so um, the, our session um, covers the topic um, about the international development, um, uh, especially the trades, markets, and policy. And uh, we have like seven presenters. Um, and I would like to um, welcome Yet as a first speaker. So let's welcome him. Good. Yeah. Okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is Wyatt Proct. I'm a master's student at Purdue, and today I'm going to be presenting our paper, Post-Service Inputs in Rural Youth, Evidence from a Randomized Trial in Kenya. So um, there was two motivating factors behind uh, why we wanted to do this project, uh, but I'll primarily focus on the first as the most important. So um, youth underemployment has recently been identified as the more pressing issue rather than unemployment. Um, and you can think about this as not being able to work as many hours as you want, whether that's in self or wage employment. So basically think about being able to smooth the labor calendar over and fill those gaps when people uh, might not work, who generally work in agriculture mainly. Um, and the second one is generally dealt with input supply chain issues, which has been documented for a large number of inputs, but we focused on post-harvest inputs, such as um, hermetic storage bags and low-cost grain moisture meters. Um, and so like a hermetic storage bag is an example of like this bag there in the far corner, and then um, a low cost grade motion meter is like the grommet up here, which um, just literally does what it says. And then um, these are technologies that continue to face persistent supply chain issues in Kenya, which is the context where we're working. So um, we ran a clustered um, simple RCT with 40 youth groups um, in Eastern Kenya with a total sample size of 397. Um, we had 20 treatment and 20 control groups. On average, there was about 10 youth per group. Uh, and like I said, this took place in Eastern Kenya countries in Machakos, Makwene, and Kitui. Uh, our treatment trained and linked rural youth with local agri dealers to become resellers of the post harvest inputs I previously mentioned. Um, and in the context of our study, you can think about youth as being classified as anyone to 18 to 35. So that was kind of our main identification strategy. Um, so our timeline, um, like where our data comes from, so our baseline survey occurred in November and December of last year, uh, with subsequent one-day trainings happening for each treatment group uh, in December and January of this year. Um, and these trainings covered basic concepts such as like marketing, record keeping, how to make a business plan, those kinds of things, as well as the service screen management and input usage. Um, and then after that, our main focus was to evaluate people um, selling these inputs after the post-harvest period of February to April in Eastern Kenya. Um, and so to do that, uh, we linked them with those agri-dealers who provided them with 10 hermetic storage bags to start out with, um, equivalent to 2,500 Kenyan shillings, which is about 25 US dollars. We also um, provided each youth with two hygrometers to either be able to sell to farmers or offer grain moisture testing services because in a lot of these rural grain markets, these kind of technologies or services are just out of the reach. Um, and then additionally, the youth were required to put up 500 of their own money for the agri-dealer as collateral and a sign of seriousness and commitment to the project. Um, and as such, the selling period was from February to April. And then um, our outcome data is coming from our follow-up survey, which we completed in May of this year. Um, so our main contribution is to the limited impact evaluation literature concerning training and employment interventions, primarily targeting rural youth in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, a lot of the time, most of these employment interventions are focused in urban areas where it's just probably easier to try to uh, get a large group of people that you want to work with. And so this contribution is just simply testing the effectiveness of our novel entrepreneurship program on a, um, on a group that generally is um, kind of neglected in a policy lens. So um, our basic main model is just an intention to treat model um, where YIJ is um, the dependent variable and I is for individual I and youth group J. So our outcome variables include an indicator variable equal to one, the individual believed that their income was higher this year than last 
Um, untransformed and inverse hyperbolic sign of average monthly income for the sales period that I mentioned. Um, so basically, we use inverse hyperbolic sign simply to account for zero and negative values, and then untransformed and log total expenditure for the month before the um, survey. So um, just basically going quickly through a model like the highlighted variables, treatment variable, simple um, indicator variable, if someone's random signs so treatments. X is a vector of control variables. Y, I, J baseline is just simply for ANCOVA specification to produce power. And then the sub uh, variable is just a fixed effect for the sub county. Um, so our main results, generally we ran seven different specifications for our main results. So in the first column, you'll see that people generally by being assigned to the treatment group, believe that their income did increase. So that shows that there's at least a short-term psychological effect from simply being able uh, to be enrolled in a program. So a lot of the time you hear about um, kind of the limiting opportunities between what youth want to do and what they actually are able to do. So there's a gap between their aspirations, right? So simply by enrolling people and like trying to get them in a program could hopefully, I mean, take this with caution, but can hopefully increase their motivation and um, allow them to kind of increase their um, economic well-being. And then after that, we, um, uh, accounted for the average monthly income, um, and you'll see this is a highly significant effect, but what we found on average is actually this isn't coming from our intervention. Our descriptive statistics indicate that like only about 200 Canadian shillings or two US dollars were generated in income, which generally shows that like the incentives just weren't there for the youth to do that. Um, so we find that this effect is being driven by farming, which in some ways makes sense. Um, even though it's not what we expected, because farming was the overwhelming majority, or was the overwhelming, was the main um, contributor to income in our sample. And then <clears throat> the way that I interpret this as a result is that generally, if the incentives aren't there, that the really like youth are generally known as people who are disadvantaged or don't have access to skills or knowledge. Um, and so generally, uh, yeah, so generally, because of that, we believe that our training allowed them to take their to take these new skills and knowledge that they generated and apply this to already existing ventures, which in the most um, common form was uh, farming, like I said. Um, and then you'll also notice that there was no um, there was no effect on the total expenditure. So what does this mean moving forward? Um, so generally, like I said, technical training and skill development programs have potential to improve these economic outcomes for rural youth, but the incentives really need to be there. Um, in our case, simply the incentives to make money and the margins that they were making just weren't great enough. Um, and that led to a crowding in effect of farming, like I said. And then well-targeted employment interventions could help adjust this gap between raising youth aspirations and their viable economic and social opportunities. We believe that our short-term results support this argument um, for reasons that are briefly stated, um, but we're looking to investigate this area more. So we measured aspirations at baseline and then future work will kind of go uh, we'll measure how that changed um, at endline which will which is when we go back to the field later this year is something we're hoping to look at um and with that um yeah thank you for your time i'll take any questions yep yeah it's uh it would be like sorry i should have clarified that that's like an 88 percentage increase. It's is rather rather large. I think an 88 percent increase in the farm income from a one day training. Yes. Farming is. I agree. Surprising. You mentioned that. But yeah. Uh, did you test on how well the rent migration were? So yeah. So our balance was. Yeah, so we actually did all the balance tests and so, and we ran it on each specific form of income. So I believe there's about 10 different forms of income that we measured. Every single one was balanced a baseline, um, but once you did the treatment or once you did post-treatment, it was unbalanced from that, I mean, which is driven by this. But I mean, it is hard to clarify specifically what could be driving the factor, um, but that's something we're looking to investigate more. Thank you for clarifying that, yeah. If you have any intermediate outcomes that would kind of bolster that story, because another thing that people worry about about is that when you give people some training or something, mm -hmm. maybe they're going to be better respondents. So yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, 
So one of the things when we go back to the field that we want to look at is kind of social desirability bias. Like, are these people just kind of telling us what we want to hear? Um, so that's kind of a more of an intermediate outcome that we're looking to measure. Um, but yeah, we do have others and I would be glad to talk to you about those. Yeah. So more interested in that they were given the storage bags. Yes. Front. Did they use the storage bags? Is this like temporal arbitrage increasing? Uh, generally, I don't believe they did, but that's an actual point. That's a good point to look into. Um, yes. You mentioned that you went to schools of people. Yeah, I think there was definitely contamination. Like these are working in rural areas and uh, people know each other. I mean, I don't believe there was contamination in, as in like a control group member was selling or doing anything um but there was definitely like people know each other but, yeah so uh yeah okay so uh i have to uh, have to, uh so yeah, thank you yes thank you Do you know how to start the slideshow? Yeah. Okay, thanks everyone for being here. Um, this is joint work with Ashish Shenoy also at UC Davis. Our, our paper is trying to explore the way that labor markets, agricultural labor markets in the US respond to changes in, in Mexican migration flows. And the motivation for this paper is, is pretty straightforward. It's based on the fact that a large majority of, of ag workers, of hired agricultural workers in the US have been born in Mexico. And it's also based on the fact that these migration flows have been declining for, for more than 15 years. And from surveys, we know that labor shortages are, are, are high and the prevalence is increasing. So, the question is very straightforward. We're trying to, to evaluate and measure like the different margins of response to these changes in, in migration flows. And we want to see how these changes affect wages, how they, how they change sort of the composition of the labor force and the type of workers hired by, by farmers. And we want to also measure if the H2A program, which is the seasonal guest worker program is helping to offset the reduction in, in migration. So we're gonna document that there are important difference in the short versus long run responses of, of, of farmers. And to address endogeneity concerns, we're gonna instrument county level migration using the interaction of violence at origin in the Mexican municipalities with sort of the pre-existing pre network strength of, of, of migration. So to do this, we're gonna use this rather novel data set of matriculas consulares. This is the registry of ID cards given uh, by the Mexican consulates to Mexican citizens living in the US, regardless of, of migratory status. It does not change migratory status in the US, but it is handy, it's helpful to open bank accounts to, to get utilities. So a lot of undocumented migrants that don't have access to any other identification, uh, ask for it. And we can see in the registries the municipality of birth of, of cardholders and the county of residence. So we think and we want to argue that this is a really good data set to measure in particular undocumented migratory flows, which are hard to measure in, in our data sets because we know the county and we can like map spatially where migrants are going to the US and because we have the Mexican municipality of origin, we can map the sort of the network, the migration networks between each origin and each destination, right? So, so here we have like the networks for two very similar, very nearby municipalities in Mexico. We see that like one municipality sends mostly migrants to California or one mostly to Texas. And the idea, like the empirical strategy is that if something happens in one of these municipalities that influences migration outflows, then the counties in the US that are gonna be most affected are those that have like these stronger ties, these stronger network ties. Um, 
So a little bit more formally, what we're gonna do is like, we're gonna run these differences specification where we look at changes in labor market outcomes in industry A, in county T, in year T, in, countries, in county C, in year T, against uh, changes in the, in the stock of migrants relative to population. So like how migration flows affect either wages or employment or h 2 visa requests. And uh, we're gonna instrument that looking at uh, using this sort of shift share instrument arrival where we get violence at origin, the number of homicides in each municipality in each year. We multiply that by the network strength of each municipality county pair. And then we aggregate it across all municipalities to get a county level measure of, of a county level instrument for migration. And, and the estimates we're gonna get are causal under the assumption that, that Mexican violence really only affects agricultural labor markets in the US through migration and, and through nothing else. So under that assumption, uh, we, we can um, interpret our, our estimates as causal. Super briefly, talking about the other data sets, we're gonna get wages and employment from the QCW. We're gonna separate workers into either directly hired by the farmer or indirectly hired through, through, through contractors. We're gonna get the H2A visa request from Department of Labor and violence statistics from, from Mexican Statistical Office. And so for the results, uh, the first result we, we want to highlight is the fact that H2A visa requests are an important margin of, of adaptation from farmers. Like our estimates show that for every 100 Mexican workers that stop coming to the US, something like 14 H2A visa are, are requested. And this is a large number. If we consider that out of the, those 100 workers, something like 18 would have joined agriculture. So the pass through is, is really high. Like for every 18 workers that stop coming to, to the agricultural sector, 14 visas are requested. So, so this is by far the largest margin of, of response. And then we also see some effects on, on wages. We see that more migration uh, puts downward pressure on, on wages of directly hired workers. And it also uh, reduces the number of indirectly hired workers, at least in the short run. So like this is consistent with a very standard story of if the pool of, of workers is more abundant, farmers prefer to hire directly and they don't need to raise wages as much. Now for the long run effects, we see something quite the opposite and it's an intriguing result. We just take the long differences between 2008 and 2019 and see places that received more migrants during that period, how, they, how their labor market looks like in 2018. And places that have more migrants um, pay higher wages, like the wage increased faster, both for directly hired and contract labor. And in places that receive more migrants, the number of contract workers is higher. So this is an intriguing result. It's puzzling. We, we still don't know how to interpret it. It could be that agriculture is like inherently a tradable sector. So the margin of response is like reductions or increments in output. It could be that the, the capital labor ratio changes. So like workers, if sorry, farmers go towards more mechanized agriculture in places that receive less migrants. It could be that there is competition with other migrant reliant industries and that raises wages. We still don't know. We're still exploring sort of the mechanisms and I'd be happy to to hear any suggestions that you have. Thank you. Yeah, that's interesting. Like we really cannot tell if people are being hired over and over by the same farmers. But one thing we think is driving the results, like the H2A visa results, is that farmers know that the workers they request through the program are usually very good, very productive. They they work uh, very well. So they ask not perhaps for the same 
individuals, but for the same type of workers from the same regions every season. So I think there is some truth to that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just curious about your next episode. So how are you going to get out of this potential effect of the migrant of the logging industry? I mean, are you looking at small business growth? We like very immediately, what I think we should do is look at these same uh, estimations for construction and hospitality and see if there's an effect on wages there. Um, yeah, like we, we still don't know this paper that I'm referencing here shows that when there are construction booms in counties, more H2A visa gets requested, even though H2A visas are specifically for agriculture. So there are like some complementarities or some, some there is some competition across industries that, that, that rely heavily on, on migrant labor. So. Might be, but it also might be that if more migrants come to a county, it's, it's, it's cheaper to hire migrant labor and that spurs and that economic that's activity. Right. Sorry? And that's why they issue like um, Yeah, yeah, exactly. So so more construction businesses get started and then that drives wages in the long run uh, higher up. Yeah, I don't know, hopefully. Yeah. That I know of, yeah. Uh, the, the matriculas data set is being used more and more. And, and I think it's a super, like it has a lot of potential. Uh, the instrument, yeah, that, that I know. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining me today. Um, my name is Bernhard Dahlheimer. I'm an interim professor at the University of Kiel and a research, a visiting research fellow at the University of Minnesota. And today I'm going to present uh, to you joint work uh, with my colleague Della Dem uh from Agroscope uh, on the food supri supply elasticity in Sub-Saharan Africa. So a uh, very quick overview of this paper. So this paper tries to estimate the food supply elasticity in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, we, ident we use instrumental variable regression, standard approach from the literature and this strain of literature. Um, we find very uh, much stronger production responses to price shocks in Sub-Saharan Africa than elsewhere in the world. We also find inherently stronger um, price responses to climate shocks in Africa. So we contribute to that um, evidence base. And But our main contribution or the main contribution of this paper lies um, in estimates of the supply elasticity in the context of commodity storage and a specific context where storage is low or even non-existent in some of the places. But the motivation uh, of our paper um, uh, is food insecurity in Sub-Saharan Africa, which we know is higher than in other places uh, in the world. It's also rising and maybe even faster than in other places in the world. Um, also, what we observe is that prices in Sub-Saharan Africa or markets have kind of a dynamics of their own. Um, and when we talk about world markets developments in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, especially at crisis events, this one is the 2007-8 food uh, price crisis that you can see here. And if you look at cumulative changes of corn prices, we can see that um, uh, markets in Sub-Saharan Africa are often not very much related to international food prices and they kind of develop a very volatile and disruptive um, dynamics of their own. So we're trying to understand this a little bit better and we're kind of doing this by starting at the fundamentals and say, because if we look at the literature, what we do know is that we uh, that markets in Sub-Saharan Africa are very um, volatile. Um, and we can only usually compare this to what we do know in world markets. So with world markets are stabilized through trade, they're stabilized through storage. Um, we also have the assumption that in Sub-Saharan Africa, this is not so much the case. We have low levels of uh, storage, low levels of trade on top of the low uh, production levels um, 
uh, in the area. Um, so we're trying to get some estimates of the fundamentals of these markets, um, and that is the supply elasticities. Um, and we also want to have a look at um, what happens if storage activity is low. So if you're starting to work with um, food supply elasticities, um, there's no way around um, commodity storage theory. Um, and commodity storage theory is important to this work, uh, of course, because it is uh, it kind of... Um, describes the decision-making process of producers, sellers, uh, and consumers, whether to produce, uh, whether to consume or sell production now. Um, and uh, in essence, uh, commodity storage here proposes that these uh, producers and traders will ponder the marginal utility of consuming or selling today against the one consuming or selling in the future period. Um, of course, being dependent on both prices and production in both of these periods. And the result of this uh, mechanism is that we will have a stabilization mechanism on prices and markets because we're able to shift consumption over periods of time and we will have a consumption smoothing process. And this is driving world markets. We know that. We know that this helps to stabilize the world food markets, but we're not so sure uh, about um, Sub-Saharan Africa. So we're trying to estimate, uh, to get estimates of these parameters um, using uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And the model that we use is standard literature approach um, that has been used uh, in, in a couple of studies in the, in the recent past. And we're essentially estimating this uh, IV regression uh, where we're trying to ultimately identify um, the beta parameter here. So a uh, production response to a price change and we uh, identify the model using exogenous weather shocks. The data that we employ in this study uh, comes from a, a recent study as well, uh, the Portois 2019 paper. Um, it covers the period from 2002 to 2013. Um, so this is something that we're working right now that we want to extend this data set. So um, um, this, uh, um, but still the data covers about 173 markets in sub-Saharan Africa. So we're working on the regional level, not on the national level. Um, and the price data comes from FAO, USDA, WFP uh, um, sources um, and our... Um, Georeference precipitation temperature data is also a standard data set from the literature. So in total, we wind up with an unbalanced panel um, over 11 years. Um, and the results um, that we uh, retrieve uh, from the model um, are that we find a, in a larger supply elasticity in sub-Saharan Africa than elsewhere in the world by a factor of about three. So producers respond three times as much um, to changes in prices with their production decision than in other places of the world. Um, I'm not going to focus too much on these effects, but uh, we find in the IV regression also very, very large uh, temperature and precipitation effects on, on prices. Those are also much different than in other places um, in the world. Um, we also find that uh, across crops, at least, that the effects are very heterogeneous. And this is something that we're trying to figure out now. We'll look into more detail now to um, also have a look at different regions, different countries in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, the implication of this work is, or in our opinion, what we think now is um, that actually we have some evidence that the markets work well in a sense that price signals are transmitted to producers. So producers will respond to price signals on the market level. Of course, at a degree that could also contribute to further volatility on these markets because production is solely based on a current period and will shift, um, will have large effects on the supplies in the next, uh, in the next uh, period. We also provide further evidence that these decisions or the, uh, the market prices are strongly driven by weather shocks, much, much stronger than in other places uh, in the world. Um, and uh, the addition to the literature that we're trying to provide here is that we probably need to rethink or we need to continue thinking about commodity storage. Um, what happens uh, if there is just no storage technology uh, maybe that's an assumption that we have, or maybe an obvious one, but still one that we need to add to the model. Or maybe should there be something like a minimum requirement constraint in commodity storage 
that uh, implies, of course, as long as they don't have minimum requirements met, it doesn't make sense to shift supplies in the future because the marginal utility of future consumption will go towards zero. And that also um, um, is valid for general um, uncertainty um, in these places. Um, with that said, um, thank you very much uh, for your attention and joining uh, the talk today. Um, so the, the um, so you're trying to the, the, like the time lag uh, difference. Yeah, because so production decisions are made before the price the is prices realized. are realized. So are you thinking of the prices post harvest for the previous season? Um, yeah, we're always looking at the connection between past prices, previous season. previous season prices, and production decision. Of course, in the commodity storage theory model, it will always be about the expected price yeah. that you have, your price yeah. expectation. I mean, so that's, I mean, but that should be factored in with the weather shops. Yes, of course. Gonna, yeah. yeah. And the production measures are actual production, not solar. It's actual production. It's regional actual uh, production. Yeah, on the regional level. Yes, please. I have two questions. The first relates to we have any information on where the production response is coming from in this area or uh, Uh, yeah, first, with regards to your uh, first question, this is a pure production response, so we don't know whether this comes from yields or acreage, uh, can, be, can be both um, at this point. We're trying to look into ways in this, uh, this angle. There's the second question, which is also a very interesting one and something that we, we are thinking about as well. Um, I was enough, confident enough to say that we have a larger elasticity because um, it, it, the, the sign of the magnitude of the coefficient is large enough. And I'm a little bit careful with interpreting the, um, the statistical significance at, at these levels because of, of data issues. So I think if we add more data at some point, our coefficient will become um, significant at this point. With rise is especially, just because you mentioned it's also surprising to us, um, that we need to think about more um, because rise is also one of the easier to store um, commodities. So we would even expect a lower elasticity. Yeah, that's, that's, that's also a, a good point, important point to consider, yes. Yes, in Africa, yes, but I think there's like imports, uh, yeah, no, there's quite a, lot of, a lot of imports. It's, it's less trade than the beef that's yeah, trade. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. This one. Okay. 
Hi, all. I'm Molly. Um, let me just move that out of the way. Oh, how do I? Okay, good. So I'm going to talk about contract farming in Mozambique. Um, selection and spillover effects. So we know farming is risky. Markets are often incomplete in these rural markets. And so from a policy perspective, if you care about poverty reduction, but also market integration, contract farming is one of the ways people get at this. Contract farming connects farmers to formal agricultural markets, but it also has other potential benefits that we think are welfare enhancing, if not income enhancing. So the focus of this project is on these three research questions. First, who participates in contract farming? And I'm going to show you it's the households that are already engaged in the market, the ones who have more skin in the game. And second, does this contract farming participation improve welfare? I'm going to argue yes, through a better price distribution. So if you think farmers are risk averse, welfare, this is welfare enhancing. And then third, do non-contracted households benefit? And I'm gonna, again, show you that yes, they do. And these benefits in this scenario are actually accrued at the regional level as opposed to just the households that contract. So there's three main contributions to this project. The first is it's a pretty novel data set. We have one year prior and two years post contracting and the sample selection allows for spillover identification, which I'll talk about in a second. The second is that I'm not going to talk about it today, but it's the paper, it's a theoretical framework that shows these firm and farmer decisions into contracting. And one of the things that falls out of this model is this spillover channel through spot markets. And so the idea is that if I'm a firm and I travel to a village to pick up my harvest from my contracted farmers, if there's any space left over in that truck, it's profit maximizing for me to buy from the non-contracted farmers. I've already paid the fixed transport costs. I wanna get as much product as I can out of that village. And so those non-contracted non farmers benefit from selling to me. So the setting is there's a firm that contracts for maize in Mozambique. It was participated in this agricultural pilot done by Let's Work in the World Bank from 2017 to 2019. And under this pilot, the firm expanded their contract farming operation by 50%. And so it's these newly contracted regions that are going to be what we study. So the way you should think about the contracts is that they're group contracts, they're variable price, prices are not fixed at the beginning of the season, and the firm does offer access to inputs and credit, but there's very little uptake. So you should think about this basically as a marketing contract. It's an agreement that I'm going to buy from you and you're going to sell to me. So we have, again, these three sample groups. The first one are the households who live within the contracting region and become contracted for the 2018-2019 agricultural seasons. The second group, which is in the green, are going to be households who live within the contracting region. They're in the same village as the contracted households, but who are not contracted themselves. And the third group are those blue. They're the households in areas outside of the contracting region. The firm does not work there. So this is our empirical framework. The coefficients we care about are beta one and beta two. So beta two is gonna tell us the spillover effect. It's identified based off of differences between non-contracted households within the region and non-contracted households outside of the contracting region. And beta one is this sort of pure contracting effect of for identified off of variation for households who are contracted and who are not contracted within the region. So the total effect of contracting is beta one plus beta two, the spillover effect just beta two. Oh, and I control for like baseline household characteristics and time. So these are baseline summary statistics. The households, what's the takeaway from this slide is that the households who select into contracting, they're larger households, so they have more labor, they have more land, they, have, they harvest more maize, and they're much more likely to sell maize to participate in the market at baseline. So what happens after contracting? These are distributions of prices faced by each of these three sample groups for 2017, when no one was contracting, 2018, the first year contracting, and 2019. So what's important for us is that 
In 2017, everyone's facing about the same distribution. The contracted households on average are getting a bit higher price. Not surprising. They're the ones who have more to sell, more likely to participate in the market. In 2018, post-contracting, we see the contracting distribution shrinks dramatically, which is what we'd expect because all those contracted households should be getting the same price. So it almost becomes degenerate. But what's key for us for the spillover channel is that for this green line, these non-contracted households, we see some of them are now also with the contracted households getting the contracted advice, price, but there's also this lower end of the distribution gets cut off. And so the idea is that it could, it could be two different channels. One, I might get the contracted price or a higher price because I sell to the firm when it comes to the village. But also if I'm a trader and I was going around farm gates in that village and I know that there's another buyer who might sell them a higher price, it's possible the traders had to increase their price. And so essentially what happens is this lower end of the price distribution for these non-contracted households gets cut off. So this regression form of what we've been talking about, we see that overall, so pooling all the years, the price increase is coming through the contracting region as opposed to contracting status. And it's about 11% increase in prices. But if you split between the two years, we see in 2017-18 that the benefit in prices was about twice for the contracted households directly that it was for the region. But in 2019, that disappears. In 2019, the coefficient on contracting status actually goes negative. So all of the price increases at the region level. And what happens is in 2019, there was a cyclone that came through. And so the World Food Program came into the market, bid up maize prices for its food security programs within the region. So if there were higher prices out there in the market, they could be had but not if you were contracting and you, you stick to your contract, but we're still getting rid of the lower end of the price distribution. So overall prices go up. In terms of income, we see that your income from May sales does go up. So it's about 20% higher for the contracted households, 15% higher for the non-contracted households, but that doesn't translate into significant overall household income increases. So, that's, those are the main takeaways, that the main benefit of contracting in this scenario is that you're facing a better price distribution. Again, if you believe these households are risk averse, this is a welfare enhancing outcome. And then the spot market channel generates these spillovers. And so inside the contracted region, prices are 11% higher. Maize incomes are 20% higher if you're contracted. 15% higher if you're a non-contracted household compared to households outside of the contracting region. Thanks. <laughs> I don't know how many minutes that was. Yeah. <laughs> of this. Yeah, so it's non randomly assigned. So the best that I can do is why I have those baseline household um, controls. And so you could, I haven't done a probability matching, but, but you could think of it in that way. So yeah, I can't claim that this is hundred percent causal, but I can do the best I can to control for those baseline differences in households. Oh, how it's, it's a maze. So it's pretty homogeneous. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, 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 so prices are not guaranteed in advance, but in general, the firm offers market prices are a bit higher than market prices and the firm, so if you think about the price that you're going to receive from a trader who comes directly to your farm gate versus a price that you receive if you go into the market, you would expect the market price would be higher than what the trader is willing to offer you if they come farm gate. But 
this firm is basically offering you that market price or something similar without you having to go to the market. So it's going to be higher than the prices you could receive, higher than the lower prices you could receive if you sold at home. But so the farmers know that the firm offers better prices on average, but it doesn't know ex ante what those prices are going to be. So the way you should think about it is, um, is basically the way you should think about it is that these farmers, when they're making a decision to contract, they're making a choice between price distributions. Do I want to face the price distribution of the market or do I want to face the price distribution of the firm? And the price distribution of the firm is going to be much tighter. Yeah, I haven't. I've just, so the way they report is they just report the price per kg of where they sold. I don't think I can take into account like the transportation cost to get them there. But if they sell to the firm, then there are no transportation costs that they incur themselves. The firm comes and picks it. Yeah, they have to take it. Okay. Yeah. I mean, okay. Yeah, I can look into that. I, I think that most of the non-contracted households still end up interacting with the firm in sales, but, but I'll check into that. How many end up going to the market? Yeah, I'll check. Yeah, so that is a, so the, the argument I'm making about why people select into contracting is because it's the risk they face ex ante with prices. If I know, if I'm more price risk averse, then I like that I have a guaranteed person to sell to who's going to give me something comparable to the market price without me having to go out there and incur the cost I'm looking for it, the transport of it, et cetera. But if I am less risk averse, or if I maybe have a smaller amount to sell, then I might be willing to bet on the market that there might be higher prices out there in the market and I think that I can find them. And so then I don't want to commit into this contracting. Yeah. I mean, but also the, also, so I guess my last point and then I'll get out of the next person's way, but also if you're not contracted, you don't have a guarantee that you can get the contracted price because you're, it's based on the availability of the firm if there's space in my truck to buy from you. So it's not a guarantee, but yeah. But yeah, thank you for the comments, guys. Um, the next presenter um, is uh, presenting um, via Zoom. So I would like to, oh, it's Jayang, okay, cool. Um, yeah, would you be able to share your screen and unmute yourself? Great, thank you. Yeah, please go ahead. Hello, China. We can't hear you. Uh, Jaren, we can't hear you. Hmm. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, now we can hear you. Okay, great, okay. great. Okay, thank you.
Hello everyone, my name is Zhang Lu. I'm a PhD student from Zhejiang University. Today I will talk about the impact of internet adoption on poverty vulnerability of rural household panel evidence from China. At the beginning of my presentation, I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors. And this is an outline which has four parts. I will start with a little bit of background. And you know, China has seen a significant reduction in the incidence of extreme poverty since the economic reforms. However, new challenges are born, such as the potential risks of returning to poverty. So it's also important to understand your household ability to respond to unexpected shocks uh, like natural disasters or uh, conflicts and identify ways to prevent them from falling into future poverty. In that case, we need to involve poverty vulnerability, the ability to cope with shocks to avoid falling into poverty in the future. And poverty vulnerability measures the probability that a family's income or consumption will fall below the poverty line due to unexpected uh, shocks. And on the other hand, China has made considerable progresses in, the, in its internet development in the past 30 years. And the internet exerts a strong influence on economic growth. So um, we wonder whether internet adoption could also in improve rural household ability to cope with the risk of not falling into future poverty. So um, in this study, we aim to identify the causal effects of internet adoption on household poverty vulnerability and try to understand the impact of internet adoption across regions and household characteristics. And finally, the mechanism methods are used to uh, verify several potential pathways. And the data used in this paper comes from China Family Panel Studies, CFPS. We employ a, a difference in differences designed to estimate the average effects from the follow equation. Um, uh, uh, and this is the outcome of interest for household I. We calculate the vulnerability by using the method provided by uh, Holberg. And, and the bit one is the estimate effects of the adoption of the internet on vulnerability. Adopt IT is a dummy variable for, intern, uh, for internet adoption. And it equals one for the pure after household I adopt the internet. And as you know, uh, recently some studies have shown the two-way fixed effects estimator with staggered uh, treatment adoption will yield uh, best estimates. So we also use the method provided by Calway and Santana to estimate the impact. And next I will report the main results of our study. Uh, the three vulnerability uh, variables were calculated based on three different poverty lines. And this one is uh, China's domestic poverty line, and these are the two international poverty lines. The results in table one suggest that internet adoption would reduce the poverty vulnerability by about 12.49.3 and 17.7 percentage points, respectively. And this figure shows the effect of internet adoption on household vulnerability estimated under uh, the parallel chain assumption with different poverty lines. The non hypothesis of the parallel uh, trend uh, uh, assumption holds among all periods. And the blue bars uh, represent pre treatment periods, the red bars uh, present uh, post treatment periods. In table two, we found that the impact of internet adoption are different across regions and household characteristics. Compared with the eastern uh, region, the, uh, the west, western and central region is less developed and benefit more from internet adoption. And the results show that uh, the household with fewer sites of the household had with health problems would have a larger impact from internet adoption. In table three, uh, the mechanism analysis showed that internet adoption caused a 33% uh, increase in the uh, household wage income and increased the share of uh, non-farm workers in the family. 
It also raised an average rural household consumption level by about uh, 16%. And internet adoption's effect on household insurance participation is also positive. In the last three columns, uh, internet adoption led to a reduction in the total medical expenditure and declined the share of members hospitalized and the share of elderly members with chronic disease. Well, um, to sum up, internet adoption significantly reduced household poverty vulnerability and heterogeneity uh, effect analysis indicated the impact of difference across household characteristics. And households in less developed regions with fewer family size and households with head of less healthy uh, conditions benefit more from internet adoption. And uh, the mechanism analysis verifies several important potential ways, uh, pathways. Internet adoption increases the rural household open employment opportunities and enhances the ability of access to health information and online health services. And it also increases the ability to access uh, insurance and the market information and participation. And that's all. Thank you for your attention. Sorry, I, I can't hear you clear. Your voice is very low. Sorry, I, I can't hear you. Yeah, that's a very short question, but just a bit more on how vulnerability was that. How the vulnerability was that? How was calculated and why vulnerability instead of looking at the poverty directly? So, one of the audience. Is asking that uh, how you compute uh, the vulnerability, uh, vulnerability, and um, why not like using the poverty um, um, directly, but um, the vulnerability. So why did you use vulnerability instead of like poverty? So that was the question, I think. Okay, thank you for asking. Uh, oh, this former vulnerability matter uses single cross-sectional data. Uh, which is criticized for its inability to control an observable household specific. And uh, so we followed Hobart and used a panel version of the method to estimate vulnerability. Uh, we added the uh, household income in the last period in our calculation. And uh, did I answer you? Okay, thank you, China. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, should we move on? Thank you. Thank you, China. So, thank you. No, anyway. um, so uh, the, I would like to invite the next presenter, uh, Sam. Uh, good morning, everyone. I am Samyam from University of Georgia, and the paper I'm presenting today is called Refugee Crisis and Labor Market Outcomes in Brazil, which started just a few months ago as my second year paper with my colleague Hugo. So a little bit of context. Um, up until um, early 2000s, 
Venezuela used to be one of the richest countries in Latin America, thanks to their immense proven oil reserves, um, the largest in the world. And um, their GDP was very much tied with oil exports. However, the drop in the global oil prices in early 2010s uh, hit their economy pretty severely. And this coupled with the government mismanagement led to an unprecedented uh, humanitarian crisis in Brazil, uh, in Venezuela, leading to um, hyperinflation and increasing crime, crime um, and um, shortage of very basic goods and services like medicine and food and so on. So this led to millions of uh, Venezuelans leaving the country, especially to neighboring countries like Colombia, Ecuador, and so on. And around 300,000 of them are in Brazil as per the UNSCR report as of late 2021. So <clears throat> we are trying to analyze uh, the effects of this refugee crisis on various labor market outcomes of Brazilian citizens. And for today, I'm only specifically um, focusing on earnings, the effects on earnings. I'm still uh, analyzing the impacts on other outcome variables. So the geographical setting is pretty important for a part of our analysis. <clears throat> so this is Venezuela in orange and Brazil in blue. Uh, for the first part of our analysis, we're focusing only on the state of Roraima, which has a, um, a big share of the total Venezuelan refugees in Brazil. And um, we, so um, saving the, the details for later, Roraima is pretty, isolated from the rest of the country. Um, and so we can, we're taking Horaima as a treatment unit and other three control, uh, other states as control, including Acre, Hondonia, and Amapa, which are all similar in characteristics to Horaima in terms of social, economic, and geographical uh, characteristics. And they're also border states. Um, and our data also shows that um, this figure plots the number of Venezuelans per 10,000 Brazilians over time for different states. And it shows that the number of, the share of Venezuelans increased uh, tremendously after 2015 in Horaima, but not in other control states, as well as in Amazonas. Oh, also, I forgot to mention that we're not taking Amazonas as a control state because of the possibility of the spillover of uh, refugees. So the data we are using is primarily, it comes from the annual social information report or HIES, which is an annual data collected by the Brazilian Institute of um, Geography and Statistics. And it contains information on the universe of uh, Brazilian formal uh, labor workers and we're using data from 2012 to 2017. And for a part of our analysis, we also use the National Committee for Refugees or CONAR data uh, that contains information at the municipality level, uh, the information on refugee status request application. So for the first and econometric model, uh, we have um, our outcome variable is at the individual level and we're regressing it on a bunch of stuff, including D here, which is a dummy variable that is equal to one if an individual is from Horaima and year 2015 or after. And we're doing that for each year except 2014, which we're taking as a benchmark year for comparison, which is a year before the um, crisis started and we're also adding some individual level covariates like age, A squared and education and so on. And uh, time and individual fixed effects. So a limitation of the event study is that um, here specifically, we are assuming that the only thing that uh, happened in Horema is the refugee influx. So there could be a lot of other things happening as well, like. Uh, maybe due to the Venezuelan crisis, the exports decreased or something. So that may be causing the effects. So there could be multiple mechanisms of effect. So to deal with that, uh, one thing we could do is uh, to see the effects of the number of refugees per municipality on wages. 
but unfortunately we don't have that data. So we, what we do have is the municipality level of refugee application data, which we are using as a proxy for total refugees. And yeah, and the variable is um, again, endogenous. So um, because refugees can go and choose their location as per their will, and various, various other factors. So we are using an instrumental variable, which is a function of the road distance between the border and the municipality, and the percentage of population that was foreigners in 2012 or pre-crisis. So this is, this shows the results from the event study. So before the crisis, as you can see that we have a parallel trend because the difference is not significant, but after the crisis started, um, the, way, the earnings in um, Horaima was increasing compared to other controlled states. And we um, performed two sets of um, regressions, one including individual fixed effects and the other including municipality fixed effects. And the results are robust to both the variation and the in, uh, variation in the specification. So, which is also confirmed by our instrumental variable analysis. Uh, so we see that the, there's an increase in the earnings of, in, in the municipalities where with higher refugees. But it very, what is very interesting is that when we disaggregate by different economic sectors, we see that the re restaurant sector had a decrease in earnings. So restaurant sector was the sector with the highest share of um, refugees. Um, so yeah, which is pretty interesting. So overall, I think, so we can see what's happening is that the overall uh, effect is positive on wages of Brazilian citizens, but uh, there's a negative effect on the wages of Brazilians involved in the <clears throat> sector that's, uh, that has the highest share of um, uh, Venezuelans. And I think uh, an explanation for that could be that, yes, there is a shock in labor supply, but that is only a shock in like a particular uh, sector, but there's also the refugees are bringing in um, an increase in demand for goods and services so that maybe like driving up the overall earnings of the population. And we still need to disentangle that mechanism, which is going to be the next step. Thank you. Um, I'm just curious, like, so how comparable are these other areas that you did? I mean, are they as a same politics in the Amazon? Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, uh, yeah, I think Amazon mostly lies in Horaima and Amazonas, but yes, in terms of population and HDI and literacy, uh, that's how we chose. Horaima, um, sorry, uh, Acre, Hondonia, and Amapa. Um, yeah, we tried to choose some other, like Para and Tonkatins, but like they had a very high population. So, so we, yeah, I should have put a. Uh, you mean why am I, I'm not including this? Oh, uh, Amazonas and Para. But I, th I think there, there's, there's not a lot of uh, refugees in Amazonas to begin with. Yes, because there's only one border crossing between Venezuela and, and uh, Brazil, which is uh, the BR-174 highway that runs to Horaima. And once you enter Horaima, so you could either uh, stay there or continue in Amazonas. Uh, to the metropolitan city of Manaus, but once you get there, your road basically stops there. <clears throat> no, that's not possible because of the Amazon forest. Uh, yes. Price? Schooling, oh, we have the data on like how many years of schooling they did. Is that what? 
Oh. Okay, so you mean like uh, the slightly adverse effects on low educated individuals, but like more positive on. I think you can check if your results okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah, that's that's uh, what is in the plan as well. Thank you. How many refugees came across land versus flu? Yes. I would think that maybe the ones who flu are going to be the higher educated, higher income. And so then maybe you can strengthen your argument that these are really the low, even if you don't have as much data, strengthen the argument. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, I think International Migration Institute uh, and UNHCR, they have a report in 2021. So they did a survey and they sh saw that 100% came from land in Brazil. Okay. And um, I think if they, uh, the, those who are more economically well off, they could fly to one of those uh, coastal states like, uh, like Sao Paulo or Rio de Janeiro. And so like, uh, we are only focusing on the these Northern states. So like no one would be flying from Caracas to Amapa, for example. Thank you. Okay. Last but not least, um, hopefully, um, I'm the last presenter. Um, yeah, so I have to just to make sure. Oh, I can. Thank you. Um, so, um, yeah, so for our work, um, we're trying to look at, um, um, the relationship uh, between the early year milk price and the child stunting uh, status like today. Um, and we are looking at the like, case in Zambia. So, so the research question uh, that we have is like quite straightforward. Um, we are trying to link the early year milk price um, to the child stunting and see if um, it's, um, it's somehow like contributing to the child stunting um, uh, today. And we also looked at the effect uh, heterogeneity, um, uh, whether the, the effect is differ by region uh, or wealth group. Okay. So this is the literature that we built our uh, like study on. Uh, so um, economists uh, view nutrition as a function of uh, price and wealth. And they mostly, uh, they used to focus more on like quantities, uh, like calories uh, than quality. Um, and, but very recently, um, many are working on like how the animal uh, source protein consumption can matter for like child's uh, linear growth, uh, especially the fresh milk. And uh, the people also um, care about the timing of shock um, could also matter. Um, so it is very well uh, documented in the, um, the, the, the literature that tries to relate um, the environment and the literature. So how the early year, uh, the weather extremes could uh, end up affecting um, the stunting um, today. And um, uh, what children consume in the first two years can be deterministic uh, to stunting. Uh, and also it's hard to reverse the status um, when uh, once um, one gets stunted. And those are uh, heterogeneous uh, price effects exist. So these are the literature, uh, the summary of the literature that I try to rely on. 
Yeah, so the, these are data that I'm like weaving together. So uh, we're using uh, DHS, uh, the Zambia Demographic House Survey data. Uh, it's a cross section 2018 uh, that is um, uh, collected in 2018. Uh, so we're using like stunting measure, which is a, a chronic malnutrition uh, measure uh, based on height for age Z score. And we also extract um, like a bunch of confounders, um, potential confounders, disease, maternal education, health environment, and other uh, demographics, uh, both at the child level and household level. And we also, um, and we are linking this DHS to the food price data uh, that is available at the monthly level, at the district level, and is collected by the Zambian St uh, Central Statistical Office. Um, and this data covers uh, the year from 2013 to 2018. And we chose uh, the male meal uh, price, which is made of um, uh, the, uh, maize, uh, and it's also a staple food of Zambia, uh, and also fresh milk, and uh, to capture the relative price movement of both um, staple food and nutrient uh, dance food. And we also complement our data set with um, the weather data, uh, which, is, uh, which are, um, uh, which I gained from uh, Modis and Church. So uh, just to give you a sense, like how the price uh, surge happened in, um, to, uh, in Zambia. So there was a currency uh, crisis. Um, so it um, happened in 2015 and uh, it's uh, like pushed the price to go like really higher uh, in, 2000, uh, in late uh, 2015 and um, and also there was a weather shock uh, that happened uh, like globally um, in 2016 that also like pushed the price, uh, the food price to go higher. And um, yeah, so that's that. So this, so, so the, um, I'm showing the, 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 the price trends um, uh, from like 2013 to 2018 that is relevant to, uh, that could be relevant to uh, the child, thing, uh, child stunting, um, uh, that I have, um, um, yeah, so the, the child uh, that I use as a data. And this is uh, kind of like punchline um, for uh, our work. I mean, um, in terms of like uh, descriptive um, analysis. So this shows uh, the, the diet transition, um, like from breastfeeding to milk complement. So um, as you can see, um, so there's a diet transition happening uh, among the 12 um, to 24 age group. So, uh, so here the line graphs are showed um, the breastfeeding rates uh, over age group. And also these bar graphs are showing like how they're um, complementing uh, their diet with milk. So as you can see, um, there's a like, different behavior um, by a region, the urban rural. And um, like urban people, a quit breastfeeding, uh, breastfeeding like earlier than the rural population. Uh, that's something that we could expect, right? Um, and they are more uh, exposed to, uh, and they're uh, consuming more milk um, than the rural. Um, I mean, the urban area, uh, population in the urban area are like consuming more milk. And uh, so there's also a heterogeneous uh, pattern um, um, by wealth group. Um, so uh, the wealth group, um, uh, wealthy like, population are more uh, drinking more water um, than the rural household. So that's what we see. Uh, and so, so, the, so here, um, since the diet transition is happening in the 12 to 24 uh, age boundary, so we are linking um, the price of the second year average price um, of milk and both um, both milk and melamine price to um, uh, to each child. So the price measures that we're using is very specific to each child. Yeah, so we're subsetting the children uh, older than 24 months old uh, who completed uh, the first two years of life. Um, and this, yeah, so we're subsetting this amateur uh, population. And uh, this is the results. Uh, we use uh, the two different uh, estimation strategy. Um, um, one is OLS and the other is uh, correlated, uh, correlated render effects um, private model. 
and we find that um, the 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 po positive relationship between the second year average uh, fresh milk price and the risk of stunting, um, especially in the urban area. And um, so I, this is the predictive margins per uh, wealth group. So we also see that um, among the, the pro, pro groups, uh, the slope is uh, higher. And uh, as a relevance check, um, like we also add uh, the second year, like uh, weather extreme variables to see uh, if uh, it's um, um, impacting the, the, the um, our analysis. But even if uh, we add the second year, like weather extreme variables, um, uh, we still find the, the relationship as uh, significant. So this is the conclusion. So we um, find that um, there's a the relationship. Uh, so, so it's not a causal analysis uh, for sure, but um, it is quite suggestive uh, that um, uh, that that early year uh, the milk price could matter for like chance, uh, child stunting uh, today, especially in the urban setting. And it's uh, we also like show the infant feeding version of Bennett's law. Uh, the poor households uh, introduce less diverse foods to their children as their uh, relative income decreases, and this could lead to higher risk of stunting. And that's it. Um, yeah, I would. Have, yeah, thank you. Yeah. So, any questions from the audience? Uh -huh. like, are they substituting milk consumption for one-to-one volume? No. How, how, what's the, the coverage of the product? So that's, um, I mean, um, so the, the data also only documents um, um, the 24 hours, like we call. For milk consumption, so uh, it's only a dummy like variable. So whether or not they get, they consume milk or not, so that's uh, the only information that I can get. Relevant. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I just, I just don't have a good sense of, in this context, how much people are actually relying on milk yeah. as a substitute and mm -hmm. how responsive I am to price and what it does to my clothing price. So I think I may be mm -hmm. more certainly sensitive to, I mean, and I know in, in Kenya, trying to convince households to like feed animal protein. Right. Yeah, it's right. Like it's a hard thing to convince them of. So I just, I mean, yeah, that's uh, what the data tells. Um, and um, like, um, I think I have to like more, uh, so to, to make it more robust, uh, I think we need uh, like specific like consumption data, right? Um, but um, our like results only like stays, um, um, I mean, it's just a suggestive result. So that uh, the, the earlier like milk price can uh, contribute to stunting in some way. Um, yeah, but I think that's the only uh, thing I can tell at this point. Okay, great, thank you.